Chapter Two of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. Stark waited until they should tire of their own silence. Finally, one demanded, "Of what country are you?" He answered, "I am called Nchaka, the Man Without a Tribe." It was the name they had given him the half-human aboriginals who had raised him in the blaze and thunder and bitter frosts of mercury a stranger said the leader and smiled he pointed at the dead kamar and asked did you slay him he was my friend said stark i was bringing him home to die two riders dismounted to inspect the body one called up to the leader he was from kushat if i know the breed thord and he has not been robbed he proceeded to take care of that detail himself a stranger repeated the leader thord bound for kushat with a man of kushat well i think you will come with us stranger stark shrugged and with the long spears pricking him he did not resist when the tall thord plundered him of all he owned except his clothes and kamar's belt which was not worth the stealing. His gun Thord flung contemptuously away. One of the men brought Stark's beast and Kamar's from where they were tethered, and the earthmen mounted, as usual over the violent protest of the creature, which did not like the smell of him. They moved out from under the shelter of the walls into the full fury of the wind. For the rest of that night and through the next day, and the night that followed it, they rode eastward, stopping only to rest the beasts and chew on their rations of jerked meat. To Stark, riding a prisoner, it came with full force that this was the North Country, half a world away from the Mars of spaceships and commerce and visitors from other planets. The future had never touched these wild mountains and barren plains. The past held pride enough. To the north the horizon showed a strange and ghostly glimmer where the barrier wall of the polar pack reared up gigantic against the sky. The wind blew down from the ice, through the mountain gorges, across the plains, never ceasing. And here and there the cryptic towers rose, broken monoliths of stone. Stark remembered the vision of the talesman the huge structure crowned with eerie darkness. He looked upon the ruins with loathing and curiosity. The men of Mech could tell him nothing. Thord did not tell Stark where they were taking him, and Stark did not ask. It would have been an admission of fear. In the mid-afternoon of the second day they came to a lip of rock where the snow was swept clean, and below it was a sheer drop into a narrow valley. Looking down, Stark saw that on the floor of the valley, up and down as far as he could see, were men and beasts and shelters of hide and brush and fires burning. By the hundreds, by the several thousand, they camped under the cliffs, and their voices rose up on the thin air in a vast, deep murmur that was deafening after the silence of the plains. A war-party gathered now before the thaw. Stark smiled. He became curious to meet the leader of this army. They found their way single file along a winding track that dropped down the cliff face. The wind stopped abruptly, cut off by the valley walls. They came in among the shelters of the camp. Here the snow was churned and soiled and melted to slush by the fires. There were no women in the camp, no sign of the usual cheerful rabble that follows a barbarian army. There were only men, hillmen and warriors all, tough-handed killers with no thought but battle. They came out of their holes to shout at Thord and his men and stare at the stranger. Thord was flushed and jovial with importance. "'I have no time for you,' he shouted back. "'I go to speak with the Lord Kiaran.' Stark rode impassively, a dark giant with a face of stone. 
From time to time he made his beast curvet, and laughed at himself inwardly for doing it. They came at length to a shelter larger than the others, but built exactly the same and no more comfortable. A spear was thrust into the snow beside the entrance, and from it hung a black pennant with a single bar of silver across it, like lightning in a night sky. Beside it was a shield with the same device. There were no guards. Thord dismounted, bidding Stark to do the same. He hammered on the shield with the hilt of his sword, announcing himself. "'Lord Ciaran, it is Thord, with a captive.' A voice, toneless and strangely muffled, spoke from within. "'Enter, Thord.' Thord pushed aside the hide curtain and went in, with Stark at his heels. The dim daylight did not penetrate the interior. Cressets burned, giving off a flickering brilliance and a smell of strong oil. The floor of packed snow was carpeted with furs, much worn. Otherwise there was no adornment, and no furniture but a chair and a table, both dark with age and use, and a pallet of skins in one shadowy corner with what seemed to be a heap of rags upon it. In the chair sat a man. He seemed very tall in the shaking light of the cressets. From neck to thigh his lean body was cased in black link mail, and under that a tunic of leather dyed black. Across his knees he held a sable axe, a great thing made for the shearing of skulls, and his hands lay upon it gently as though it were a toy he loved. His head and face were covered by a thing that Stark had seen before only in very old paintings, the ancient war-mask of the inland kings of Mars, wrought of black and gleaming steel. It presented an unhuman visage of slitted eye-holes and a barred slot for breathing. Behind it sprang out in a thin, soaring sweep, like a dark wing edge on in flight. The intent, expressionless scrutiny of that mask was bent not upon Thard, but upon Eric John Stark. The hollow voice spoke again from behind the mask. Well? We were hunting in the gorges to the south, said Thord. We saw a fire. He told the story of how they had found the stranger and the body of the man from Kushat. Kushat, said Lord Kiaran softly. Ah. And why, stranger, were you going to Kushat? My name is Stark, Eric John Stark, Earthman out of Mercury. He was tired of being called stranger. Quite suddenly he was tired of the whole business. Why should I not go to Kushat? Is it against some law that a man may not go there in peace without being hounded all over the Norlands? And why do the men of Mech make it their business? They have nothing to do with the city. Thord held his breath, watching with delighted anticipation. The hands of the man in armor caressed the axe. They were slender hands, smooth and sinewy. Small hands, it seemed, for such a weapon. We make what we will our business, Eric John Stark. He spoke with peculiar gentleness. I have asked you, why were you going to Kushat? Because, Stark answered with equal restraint, my comrade wanted to go home to die. It seems a long, hard journey just for dying, the black helm bent forward in an attitude of thought. Only the condemned or banished leave their cities or their clans. Why did your comrade flee Kushat? A voice spoke suddenly from out of the heap of rags that lay on the pallet in the shadows of the corner. A man's voice, deep and husky, with the harsh quaver of age or madness in it. Three men beside myself have fled Kushat over the years that matter. One died in the spring floods. One was caught in the moving ice of winter. One lived. A thief called Kamar, who stole a certain talesman. Stark said, My comrade was called Greshi. The leather belt weighed heavy about him, 
and the iron boss seemed hot against his belly. He was beginning now to be afraid. The Lord Kiaran spoke, ignoring Stark. It was the sacred talesman of Kushant. Without it, the city is like a man without a soul. As the Vale of Tanit was to Carthage, Stark thought, and reflected on the fate of that city after the veil was stolen. The nobles were afraid of their own people, the man in armor said. They did not dare to tell that it was gone, but we know. And, said Stark, you will attack Kushat before the thaw, when they least expect you. You have a sharp mind, stranger. Yes, but the great wall will be hard to carry even so. If I came bearing in my hands the talesman of Ban Kushat, he did not finish but turned instead to Thord. When you plundered the dead man's body, what did you find? Nothing, Lord. A few coins, a knife, hardly worth the taking. And you, Eric John Stark, what did you take from the body? With perfect truth, he answered, nothing. Thord, said the Lord Kiaran, search him. Thord came smiling up to Stark and ripped his jacket open. With uncanny swiftness the earthman moved. The edge of one broad hand took Thord under the ear, and before the man's knees had time to sag, Stark had caught his arm. He turned, crouching forward, and pitched Thord headlong through the door-flap. He straightened and turned again. His eyes held a feral gleam. The man has robbed me once, he said. It is enough. He heard Thord's men coming. Three of them tried to jam through the entrance at once, and he sprang at them. He made no sound. His fists did the talking for him, and then his feet, as he kicked the stunned barbarians back upon their leader. Now, he said to Lord Kiaran, we will talk as men. The man in armor laughed a sound of pure enjoyment. It seemed that the gaze behind the mask studied Stark's savage face, and then lifted to greet the sullen Thord, who came back into the shelter, his cheeks flushed crimson with rage. Go, said the Lord Kiaran. The stranger and I will talk. But, Lord, he protested, glaring at Stark, it is not safe. My dark mistress looks after my safety said Kiaran, stroking the axe across his knees. Go. Thord went. The man in armor was silent then. The blind mask turned to Stark, who met that eyeless gaze, and was silent also. And the bundle of rags in the shadows straightened slowly, and became a tall old man with rusty hair and beard, through which peered craggy juts of bone and two bright, small points of fire, as though some wicked flame burned within him. He shuffled over and crouched at the feet of the Lord Kiaran, watching the earthman, and the man in armor leaned forward. I will tell you something, Eric John Stark. I am a bastard, but I come of the blood of kings. My name and rank I must make with my own hands, but I will set them high, and my name will ring in the Norlands. I will take Kushat. Who holds Kushat holds Mars, and the power and the riches that lie beyond the gates of death. I have seen them, said the old man, and his eyes blazed. I have seen Ban Kushak the mighty. I have seen the temples and the palaces glitter in the ice. I have seen them, the shining ones. Oh, I have seen them, the beautiful, hideous ones. He glanced sidelong at Stark, very cunning. That is why Otar is mad, stranger. He has seen. A chill swept Stark. He, too, had seen, not with his own eyes, but with the mind and memories of Ban Kushak of a million years ago. Then it had been no illusion. The fantastic vision opened to him by the talesman now hidden in his belt, 
if this old madman had seen. What beings lurk beyond the gates of death I do not know, said Ciaran. But my dark mistress will test their strength, and I think my red wolves will hunt them down once they get a smell of plunder. The beautiful, terrible ones, whispered Otar, and oh, the temples and the palaces and the great towers of stone. Ride with me, Stark, said the Lord Kiaran abruptly. Yield up the talesman, and be the shield at my back. I have offered no other man that honor. Stark asked slowly, Why do you choose me? We are of one blood, Stark, though we be strangers. The earthman's cold eyes narrowed. What would your red wolves say to that? And what would Otar say? Look at him, already stiff with jealousy and fear, lest I answer yes. I do not think you would be afraid of either of them. On the contrary, said Stark, I am a prudent man. He paused. There is one other thing. I will bargain with no man until I have looked into his eyes. Take off your helm, Kiaran, and then perhaps we will talk. Otar's breath made a snake-like hissing between his toothless gums, and the hands of the Lord Kiaran tightened on the haft of the axe. No, he whispered, that I can never do. Otar rose to his feet, and for the first time Stark felt the full strength that lay in this strange old man. Would you look upon the face of destruction? he thundered. Do you ask for death? Do you think a thing is hidden behind a mask of steel without a reason that you demand to see it? He turned. My lord, he said, by tomorrow the last of the clans will have joined us. After that we must march. Give this earth man to Thord for the time that remains, and you will have the talesman. The blank, blind mask was unmoving, turned toward Stark, and the Earthman thought that from behind it came a faint sound that might have been a sigh. Then, Thord! cried the Lord Kiaran, and lifted up the axe. End of chapter 2